everyone. Welcome to Bloomberg Quint. Uh, uh, we are bringing in this special coverage uh, with respect to the Supreme Court's order on uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, the Supreme Court on Wednesday quashed the RBI's April 2018 circular, which restricted banks from providing services to virtual currency exchanges and other cryptocurrency platforms. There were several petitions filed before the Supreme Court beginning in 2017, and once the RBI circular, of course, came out and came into effect, uh, several companies joined the hearings. Uh, the hearings commenced right from August of 2018 and onward it was led by the Internet and Mobile Association of India. Uh, a number of these platforms which are part of this association uh, wanted to go up to the Supreme Court and uh, uh, seek answers as to why the RBI was seeking to uh, quash their businesses. Uh, of course, uh, we still need to look at what exactly the Supreme Court had said in its uh, judgment uh, on Wednesday uh, and what that means for the entire virtual currency industry. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague uh, Dwight Rao. Uh, he will explain to us what exactly the Supreme Court had said in its uh, judgment and you know what that means uh, for the industry as well as so the main challenge put in by the petitioners was to get the Supreme Court to quash the RBI 2018 April circular which banned the banks from essentially tying up or even providing services to the right. cryptocurrency exchanges or other platforms. Right. Now the main part of the um, judgment today that the Supreme Court has said is that the RBI does have the power to legislate or issue directions whether it's preventive or sort of to prevent any issues arising or risks arising if it feels that it does so. Right. So the RBI currently has three main major legislations which through which it can issue directions which is the RBI Act, the Banking Regulation Act and the Payments and Settlements Act. So what the Supreme Court judgment says is that even though cryptocurrencies technically are not legislated by an act of parliament or are under any of these three acts. Right. The RBI does have the power in the interest of the public to issue directives to warn any consumers of the risks that could arise. Now, the majority of the arguments put in by the petitioners were rejected by the Supreme Court, but the main argument that the Supreme Court has held up is that the RBI's powers were disproportionate in this case, that it did not look at other avenues through which it could sort of address some of the risks that they feel exist with virtual currencies or cryptocurrency mm. exchanges and other platforms. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so thank you so much for, uh, for that uh, sort of uh, brief understanding yeah. of what the order was about, Advait. Uh, but to discuss this uh, this issue further and uh, to understand the implications on the industry, uh, we are joined by N.S. Napine, who is an advocate at the Supreme Court, uh, as, as well as a cyber law expert. Uh, and in the studio, we have uh, Nishal Shetty, who is the uh, founder and CEO of uh, Wazir X, which is a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, so let me uh, open the floor firstly to you, Nishal. Uh, what do you make of this entire judgment? Uh, as far as the industry is concerned? See, I think uh, we're all elated by what has happened. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, it's been around 18 to 19 months since the circular, or close to two years now, hmm. since the circular came into effect. Uh, and uh, since the time of the circular, it has been very, very hard for uh, crypto businesses in India. And most of these businesses are startups. These are not like large companies. These are startups uh, trying to build on new technology. But the RBI uh, circular prevented us from having an effective uh, business, mm. uh, which caused a lot of uh, companies to shut down. Mm. And if you look at it today, uh, there are thousands of crypto businesses globally, but in India, you can count a handful. So I would say this judgment now opens up the floor for new startups to emerge in India and to attempt uh, their hand at this innovative technology. Mm -hmm. So the entire crypto ecosystem is elated by what has happened. Sure. We've been fighting for this and uh, we are glad that the uh, Supreme Court order squashes this whole uh, circular and terms it as unconstitutional. Yeah. So it's a, so I would just, just to correct yeah. I mean, they did not say yeah, it was they unconstitutional. Did not say it's un uh, okay. The Supreme Court's <laughs> order very clearly says that the, uh, the powers used in this situation are disproportionate. Of course, they okay. did not call the uh, the, uh, the uh, circular in itself ultra virus or unconstitutional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but they did say that the, on the test of proportionality, uh -huh. which yeah. is what uh, that is where the RBI stumbles. Upon. Exactly. Okay. Right. Uh, so, Miss Napine, uh, can I ask you uh, what is your reading of the judgment today? The fact that many of the arguments put in favor of by the petitioners was rejected, but the test of proportionality has held up by the court. What do you make of the order today? Well, I would say that the cryptocurrency uh, uh, industry has scraped through by the skin on its teeth, right? Um, so uh, it's a very, very well-crafted order. If you look at it, it goes into the background of cryptocurrencies and its evolution. 
but most importantly it also talks about the technology behind the product which is blockchain etc but primarily when you look at the order it really uh, focuses on only this one aspect of what is the harm that RBI was trying to remedy through the uh, ban on banks and payment systems. As you rightly pointed out Vishwanath, the ban was not on cryptocurrency or on exchanges etc. What RBI did was it uh, regulated the entities which were under its control. So in that sense it was not wrong in reaching out to banks and payment systems. But I had written immediately after the circular was uh, sent out and my position even then was that this was counterintuitive. Um, if at all uh, the government wants to take a definitive stand with respect to cri cryptocurrencies, it should do so. To merely do it through RBI, if that was what was intended or if it was actioned by RBI in this manner, it was a little myopic and it was also not addressing the primary issue. Because apart from the circular, they were just advisories, almost like a caveat emptor clause and nothing further. All of these and also the report of the first cryptocurrency committee, in fact I had presented before the first cryptocurrency committee and at that time also my position was that India would be better off regulating rather than banning. For the simple reason that if you are concerned about the negative elements about cryptocurrency, you will be able to uh, control those negative elements provided you have a regulation. In the absence of regulation, in a vacuum or a blanket ban, you are actually weakening your governance position. This was my argument in very brief uh, on that aspect. But in any event, the Supreme Court has gone into the fact that within a year, two committees of the government have taken very divergent views throughout the uh, history of trying to bring in some advisories with respect to uh, virtual currencies. In fact, the first came out in 2013 and then it moved into the realm of virtual currency instead of just cryptocurrency. Uh, apart from advisories, nothing further was done. The government has not taken a stand with respect to whether it really wants to ban it or regulate it. And all of these have gone into the decision on the issue of proportionality. And this is where it stands. And as you rightly said, it's not about the constitutionality of cryptocurrency that the uh, Supreme Court has decided on. That was not before the Supreme Court. What it has decided on is with respect to whether the RBI circular can withstand the test of judicial review. Right. So ma'am, we've seen this test of proportionality as a legal test play out in other uh, cases, whether it's the privacy judgment or whether it was even the Feb 12 circular uh, judgment that took place last year with the Supreme Court quashed. Do you think there's room for the RBI to bring about, if, if it does believe this is the policy to go forward, uh, that it wants to ring fence the banking system or the payment system from whatever risk that they believe exists in the cryptocurrency market, do you think this judgment leaves enough room for the RBI within its current legislative powers to regulate or to issue another circular, maybe a little bit more detailed and you know segmenting the different uh, micro industries within the larger cryptocurrency industry? I would say that uh, it is actually the way forward is likely to be more for government to regulate rather than uh, RBI to do so. Because in any event, one cryptocurrency is not really currency which would fall within the realm of RBI. And if they were to take a position that it does, it actually weakens the position of the government stand. Um, all along the government has been very clear that this is not a payment system and it is not a currency, it is not legal tender. For it to now bring it within the ambit of RBI would be very dangerous in that count. Therefore, the RBI is then left only with regulating organizations which are within its ambit which would in, in, include banks and payment systems. What then remains? If there is legitimate uh, concern. If there is any fear with the government with respect to cryptocurrencies, the ideal situation will be for the government to take a position and preferably do it as a regulation 
and whilst doing that i would strongly urge the government to not go by very myopic drafts which have already been shared it would be better that they go back to the drafting table and have a fresh look at this issue right uh, thank you so much for that uh, but let me come back to you initial um, you know as far as this circular is concerned that, that the supreme court has set aside today um, uh, what was the impact then since 2018? You said about 18, 19 months this has been going on. Uh, what has been the impact on the industry? Uh, how many companies have actually survived at the end of it? And uh, you know, what do we see in the future for the cryptocurrencies uh, and exchanges, considering now that, the, uh, the, that this, order, this uh, specific uh, circular has been set out? See, I think, um, yeah, there have been quite a few shutdowns. Uh, of the ones uh, we read about, there might be three to five uh, or seven to eight, I think, crypto exchanges that have shut down over a period of time. And there would be innumerable small startups, like, you know, two people, three people teams yeah. that we don't even know about. So I would say it might be at least 50 to 60 total startups that have shut down in the last uh, 18 to 20 months of this circular. And uh, uh, more than that, more than the shutdowns, yeah. uh, because the shutdown happened at a very crucial point when cryptos were still taking off. Uh, what has impacted negatively is new startups did not spring up. Mm. Because the moment this RBI circular came in, new startups, uh, you know, they stopped. Entrepreneurs said, we can't start into this because we won't get even banking access. Right. How do we even pay our employees? So I think the uh, you know the lack of new startups coming up is a bigger effect, um, bigger negative effect for India. And what will happen now that this has opened up is now entrepreneurs can start thinking about new ideas. Mm. And it does not really have to be only exchanges. I'll tell you simple uh, public blockchain. If you wanted to do a public blockchain like your Ethereum and Bitcoin's uh, blockchain, you would need to create cryptocurrencies on top of them. And to do that, you would need, uh, you know, in India, you would not have been able to because then you would not get a bank account. Right. But now, even if you're building a public blockchain uh, and launching it, as a company, you can have a bank account at least. So it's not, it was not even about just taking, building an exchange and mm. taking in public money. It was also building anything in the crypto sphere, which involved cryptocurrencies. And every public blockchain involves cryptocurrency. Mm. So, uh, you know, writing smart contracts, these are uh, programs you write which runs openly on public blockchains. You could not do it because you need a crypto. And if you were to go and buy crypto, your bank accounts will be seized. Right. So a lot of these things now eliminate. Now you can openly think about new ideas. Mm. And I would love to see, and I'm pretty sure, we will see not just exchanges, because we exchanges have survived irrespective. But a lot of new entrepreneurial ideas will come in the crypto space, which right. have not even been heard of or thought of. And that's what we are all looking forward to now. Right. Uh, just a, another point. I mean, uh, yes, it's true that the, the, the Supreme Court has set aside this uh, specific circular. But nothing stops the RBI with uh, coming up with fresh regulations in this regard, right? I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court has agreed that the RBI does have the power to issue uh, guidelines. See, the thing is, uh, the question today is, what is cryptocurrency? Just because it has the term cryptocurrency does not mean it's a currency. Mm. Uh, some part, if you look at it globally, global regulations, no one has been able to pinpoint and say it is a currency or an asset or a utility. Mm. In some countries, what is happening is cryptos are seen as all three. Uh, like, you know, some cryptos are uh, in under assets, some are under currencies. And uh, what the government, like, I think in the UK, what they're saying is if it, if you see a few crypto as a currency, let the central bank regulate it. If you see it as an asset, let the commodities exchanges regulate it. And if you see it as a utility, it's not under any regulation. So that's one stand. In some other country, they're saying if it terms as a security, then in the US, then the SEC would regulate it. Mm. Everything else is fine. Hmm. Now in India, the question is, first, we have to be able to classify and accept these classification, which hmm. has not been happened. Hmm. So can RBI even jump into this before there is some classification, which, right. as ma'am said, I think the first the government should lay out a framework saying these are what cryptocurrencies are supposed to be. And after that, I think any of the regulators, because we have our, uh, you know, SEBI, we have uh, RBI, we have different regulators, and parts of cryptos fall into each of these ambits. Right. So now, who has to pick and choose what has to first, I think, come from a government point of view. And then these guys can actually, you know, regulate it effectively. And that's what, as an industry, we want to help uh, formulate the right framework by first classifying what cryptos are. 
which itself today is a matter of confusion globally, not okay. just in India. Okay. Uh, Napina, I want to uh, come back to you. I mean, since uh, Nishal has mentioned uh, uh, some international jurisdiction and, and what regulation has uh, uh, been like there, uh, to your mind, what has been uh, uh, the situation out, outside, abroad? Uh, how have regulators looked at uh, cryptocurrency and, and try to regulate it at, in, in any fa fashion? And whether some of that applies to India or not? There were two things I wanted to come in on. The first part is that uh, the Supreme Court decision by itself is not really going to give certainty and confidence for businesses to build up again because it actually just opens itself out for more uncertainty today because nobody knows where the uh, government's uh, position is likely to be. On the query that you've raised, some of the most stable, which is why I started off with respect to certainty, the most stable decisions in terms of how cryptocurrency has been treated has been those jurisdictions where it has been treated as a commodity and has been uh, regulated using uh, securities market uh, regulators. So when you look at it from that perspective, then the threat that a sovereign state or a nation state would perceive from a payment system goes away and it is merely used as an asset or treated as one. So this is one possibility which uh, India could explore if it is planning to regulate instead of banning. But whichever way government wants to go, I think and I have all been saying it all along, it should take a decision quickly. Because there is one aspect of it which we have touched upon which is from the business person's perspective or the industry perspective. What about the users or what about the persons who were bold enough to get into a crypto market? All of them have been left adrift uh, because of the RBI circular. And today I would say one, they have some sucker now because they can look at uh, liquidation, they can look at moving forward. So that is one good aspect with respect to uh, the outcome in the Supreme Court judgment. But going forward, and I want to emphasize now primarily on the blockchain issue that was raised. For you to build a blockchain, I just wanted to clarify that you don't necessarily need a cryptocurrency. You can do incentivization through multiple modes. Cryptocurrency is just one of them. Tokenization was another creation of a blockchain as a product, uh, incentivized blockchain as a product process. But again, if you look at the banning of Cryptocurrency Act, and this was why I was suggesting caution and moving forward with that, it treats cryptocurrencies and tokens on the same uh, platform. It talks about it in the same breath as if both are interchangeable and one and the same. Uh, it could also be because of opacity with respect to the technology that drives both. And therefore, having clarity on these aspects and finally for a very, very small set of blockchains, they even run on fiat currencies. I just wanted to clarify this because India has been very strongly behind the blockchain industry. But the reason why the industry has not taken wings is again because of uncertainty. If the government wishes to support this as an industry, blockchain, I'm talking about not cryptocurrency here, they would necessarily have to bring in regulations which will give comfort to the industry to grow and confidence that they're not just going to be shut down tomorrow because of some interpretation of the incentivized model. The second aspect is as far as cryptocurrencies is concerned, whether it is RBI, because you raised that question again, uh, whether it's RBI which thinks it can come up with a better circular or the government which thinks of regulation or other, uh, even banning today would require a regulation for that matter. They would have to take into account all the issues that the Supreme Court has uh, set forth. So for instance, if RBI were to come forward with a new circular, how is it going to address the fact that as long as the matter was being heard, it was not able to point out any harm. But from the time of the order to its circular, it has now found a new position of harm. Right. So it would not be that easy for RBI to come forward with a new circular. Clearly, there is no ban on it. And clearly, RBI is well within its remit to regulate banks and payment systems in the manner which it sees best uh, uh, in that sense. 
However, it would have to exercise this right very cautiously so that it is not seen as merely circumvention of the Supreme Court order. Sure. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, Nishtal, if I can ask you, you know, the RBI or any regulator across the world has certain concerns, whether it's the investor's risk if they do lose money or if there's some sort of cybersecurity threat. But there's also the aspect of know your customer, anti-money laundering, which is the biggest concern that uh, even the Supreme Court judgment reads out that the RBI in its affidavit had concerns suggesting that this could be used for money laundering and therefore it could affect the regular currency system within the country. Uh, I understand that many cryptocurrency exchanges that came out of India have moved towards creating some sort of KYC compliance, AML compliance. Uh, how do you sort of ensure that you are complying with the regulator standards while at the same time uh, there is no specific direction to your companies saying that, you know, you, these are the standards you follow, this is in online with the payment companies or with banks, for instance? Right. So, see, what we've done, uh, because there's no, no guideline, we tend to look at what's happening globally. And globally, we see that uh, exchanges that deal with fiat and crypto, which mm. is, a, you know, let's say INR and crypto in our case, they tend to follow a certain KYC and AML guideline, mm. which we, uh, you know, as an exchange have uh, done it on our own. And a lot of other exchanges in India have done it. It's uh, more than, you know, following the law. It's the security of your user base, which is the most important, which is why uh, standard KYC is you know, address proof, your ID card, uh, and uh, making sure there's a manual check on that after you reach a certain, uh, you know, amount that you deposit. These are the things that we do. Uh, in terms of AML, there are these international softwares available today, which make sure that uh, even the movement of crypto is tracked globally. And if there is some unaccounted crypto moving from one country to some other exchange in another country, there are alerts put into place. So we've adopted this on our own hmm. without any regulations or any uh, mandate from any regulator. But we've done it because as an industry, we believe that if we show that this, there is a clear path, because the, you know, the fear of money laundering and all comes in if, as exchanges, we do not follow any of these. Hmm. But if we have everything clearly stated out in terms of KYC and uh, any other uh, regulatory aspects, then when the regulators do come for a dialogue, we can present to them saying that, look, this is all we've already done, hmm. which unfortunately did not happen at the time of the circular, but we are really looking forward to making that happen now. And that's why I think, as, and when one or two players do it, everyone else who comes in has to follow that guideline. So in India today, I'm proud to say that all of the exchanges do follow these, at least the KYCs are in place. Mm. And uh, like you rightly said, I think regulators should work with us to make sure that this follows. Let's say you remove the legitimate businesses, then you give rise to an underground economy mm. where nobody wants KYCs, nobody is doing anything, and there's liquidity then created. If you have legitimate exchanges with KYC in place, your liquidity then exists only on the legitimate platforms, which means everyone has to then come on board in a legitimate way. Hmm. And this, in fact, was one of our biggest concern with the RBI circular, that if we go out of the uh, right channels, then the wrong channels will get more liquidity. Okay. So this is how, you know, this whole thing happened for us. Just a, a small question. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I sound a little um, <coughs> uh, unaware, but... but isn't that where crypto started from? The point that you do not want to track uh, where the money is flowing. So this uh, this is a common uh, misconception hmm. because you know the thing is if you do not want to track something, cash is the best thing hmm. because you give cash to him, nobody knows. In crypto, the moment you transfer it from your ad, you know wallet to his, anyone anywhere in the world can actually see that. The only thing that crypto does is gives you anonymity. Okay. In a way, it's a privacy feature where it does not tell. If you can always see transaction from A to B. Right. You do not know the name behind A and the name behind B. But if the entry points are as exchanges, we can always know that you are A and mm. this guy is B. Mm -hmm. And we protect your privacy. So everything is open. But it's just that, you know, uh, it's not... Cash, I would say, is the safest way to do this rather than come to an exchange, do a KYC, do transfers. Mm. But, yeah, you can definitely make sure that nothing like, you know, AML... Um, I think once you do KYC, and th that's the entry point, because you will not get crypto out of the blue. You have to first invest your money to buy crypto. Hmm. And if that point, KYCs are put in place, whatever transactions you do after that is definitely traceable. So we, in fact, try to you know bust this myth that people think that I transfer crypto, no one will know. The whole world will know. Hmm. The only thing is, you, no one will know it is you, but at the starting point where you entered, that person or that entity can always pinpoint sure. and tell it was you. Sure, sure. Ma'am, uh, if I can ask you, 
generally what is the approach that the Indian government can take? We know that there was, like you said, there's contradictory committee reports that has taken place in 2018 and then 2019. Uh, the finance minister also said today that they were waiting for the uh, uh, the outcome of the Supreme Court case before they actually passed or approved of the draft bill that the previous Department of Economic Affairs Committee has done. Uh, basically, you know, across jurisdictions, they've decided to treat uh, crypto payment firms as uh, under the monetary authorities, investing firms under the, in, under the markets regulator. Uh, what is the coordination mechanism that India can pursue in, in that light, in your mind? See, it, uh, uh, to a large extent, uh, any legislation uh, is contingent on what is the statement of, I mean, what is the purpose for which it is being regulated, right? So here, the, uh, the government will have to decide what is the harm or mischief that it is trying to regulate against. If it is that uh, cryptocurrencies are being used as payment systems which it should not and therefore pose a threat to um, uh, fiat currencies, then that is the position from which it would have to come from. If it is that uh, there is, it recognizes the fact that cryptocurrency as a product or a cyber a crypto asset uh, is already uh, prevalent and it is already permeated markets in India and therefore it just needs regulation, then it needs to address that. And if it is about money laundering, then it needs to figure out methodologies for addressing that aspect. Uh, the issues with respect to money laundering and privacy and transparency were very well put. Just to add to that, because one of the th things I was uh, positioning my argument for regulation rather than a ban was precisely this. It also shows probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, lack of understanding or uh, understanding falling short when people talk about bans and uh, cryptocurrencies because the very manner in which cryptocurrencies work necessitate um, uh, transparency of transactions but not of people. And therefore, my argument was that when you introduce exchanges, that anonymity which the product gives cryptocurrency can be taken away by adding this layer of an exchange which then provides you with the details of the persons behind the cryptocurrency or the persons behind the transaction. So I'm just mentioning this in response to your question also because again if this is the mischief that the government wants to regulate about which is that cryptocurrency transactions are anonymous and therefore can lend itself for criminal activities, then it needs to uh, formulate its regulation based on that. So there are multiple issues here. One is how are you going to treat this product? What are you going to treat it for in the sense of what is it that you want to regulate about? Who are you going to regulate? And what is the final outcome that you're looking for out of this? And finally, what is the strength of that regulation? In the sense, do you want it to merely be a regulatory or a, a civil process or are you going to introduce criminal provisions also? If yes, then what are you going to introduce criminal provisions for? So all of these things will have to be taken into account in a well-reasoned uh, manner by the government before it jumps in. One may very well question that there have been two committees, all of them have reasoned enough, what more is needed. The problem today is you need somebody uh, as a neutral arbiter between the first committee's uh, decision to have a Crypto Asset Regulation Act as opposed to banning of Cryptocurrencies Act. So therefore, uh, having a relook with a little bit more focus on what is it that you want and why you want it may actually give a better result. Right. Uh, Nishal, let me, let me come back to you. Uh, as far as uh, the, the current ecosystem is concerned within the crypto space uh, as well as blockchain in, uh, in general, um, what are the kind of products that we're looking at? Uh, you know, at, at this stage, uh, we, we have what we understand as basic trading of, of the currencies. But other than that, what else uh, can the industry offer to, to investors, which can probably also pass the RBI's uh, you know, test of, of, of it being safe for investors? So. You know, if you look at the global crypto uh, ecosystem, um, 
the underlying, what are these cryptocurrencies? Why are there like, you know, maybe 500, 1,000 or 5,000 cryptocurrencies? Is because the entire crypto ecosystem is right now in the infrastructure building space. Mm. Uh, when I say it's in the infrastructure stage, uh, today when you type, you know, uh, HTTP colon slash slash and some dot com, uh, there's a set of servers around the world where your request goes to and then you get a response. Now in the crypto space, there are a lot of these infrastructures which are still not built out. Mm. And the beauty of crypto is that for accessing this infrastructure, you can charge users in mm. form of those cryptocurrencies. Okay. So all of these cryptos are saying we are building different kinds of infrastructure for a future which will be decentralized, mm. where no one entity will own any of these uh, protocols. Sure. But these protocols have to run on their own without a central entity. And they will be powered by these cryptocurrencies that we own. So all of these cryptocurrencies have different use cases in terms of, that, like there are some cryptocurrencies that help you uh, write smart contracts, which can uh, probably you know run some code on the internet. Mm. without any servers on some centralized uh, sure. system. Okay. And to run these, you need cryptocurrencies. So everyone is today saying that we are building the global infrastructure for in the decentralized world, and you can be involved by purchasing these cryptocurrencies sure. because these are limited in number, right. and you will be the early movers in this space. Right. So tomorrow when, let's say, uh, 500 million people start using, your early tokens would be worth much more because they would also need it. Right. So this is how it's all happening. In terms of use cases, there are uh, there are a lot of games being built which don't have to have like a centralized owner. It's decentralized, which means the ones who build the game can actually stop working on it, doesn't have to spend any money, can go and relax, but the game would still be operational, still be played by someone because it's in a decentralized system. Mm. So the whole ethos is, I'm pretty sure a lot of us must have, you know, you love some product online. You use it, but it's maybe only 100 people use it. The owner decides this is not worth it. He shuts that product, then you have to f search an alternative. Sure. In the decentralized world, once you build a code and you put it out, you don't need to work on it anymore. Mm. Only five people like it and they want to access it. They can access it any time of the day forever. Okay. So this is like the biggest difference in the decentralized versus centralized world. And this is where cryptos come into picture. All right. Just mm. to ask you, uh, what do you think the roadmap is for companies now? What should they be doing? What should they be focusing on? And what are the areas that they would need to actually put in, uh, systems in place, for instance? Uh, if I was to say from an India perspective, the biggest opportunity today is uh, because there are global products built, there are no local products that are focusing on crypto. Um, you know, and there's uh, hundreds of use cases. Uh, you could look up that. Uh, for example, people are talking about can we digitalize the entire land records such that you don't need to have a paper document. You could have just one token which belongs to your piece of land. If you sell it, you just transfer that token to someone and that owner becomes a new owner. So you can eliminate paperwork and everything thing by just tokenizing land in the country. So that's just one of the many use cases, but you could do a lot more for India mm. rather than global because I think India has a lot more uh, opportunities for crypto entrepreneurs. Sure. And I think that's where uh, entrepreneurs in India should focus on, the India problem. Do you think banks would be open to coming on with you exchanges? Have you been having conversations with uh, any of them? Very early, yes. Uh, they, uh, honestly, I, I think uh, they're all uh, pro-innovation uh, uh, and uh, startups. So as startups, we've always been, um, you know, uh, we've gotten good responses from banks. Now that uh, it's all clear, I think they're all happy to, you know, partner with all the exchanges and any startup uh, for that sure. matter. Sure. Right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nishal, for uh, joining us on this conversation. And thank you, Napane, uh, to, uh, for talking to us and taking uh, th this entire legal uh, aspect of, the, of this entire argument. Uh, just to uh, uh, end the show and try and get, uh, get uh, some kind of wrapping up of the entire day's events, uh, we have uh, my colleague Arpan Chaturvedi from Delhi, uh, who was at the Supreme Court when uh, this judgment was being delivered. Uh, of course, Arpan, if you can just take us through the highlights of the entire judgment and, and what you heard there. That's right. Uh, so the judgment basically uh, looks at this issue from uh, one particular angle uh, on which uh, the judgment has come and the court has noted that, you know, uh, the right to practice a business is a fundamental right and any curbs on that has to meet uh, the various tests uh, laid down by the court. And in this particular case, the court has noted uh, that the concerns that the RBI had spoken about, uh, uh, the measure which was taken uh, 
uh, to address that uh, is not in proportion uh, and, and the court has given certain examples uh, to justify their decision. Uh, number one, the court says that in the last five years, uh, uh, the RBI has not raised any specific issue of losses uh, to the uh, uh, institution, financial institutions regulated by it uh, because of any of uh, the virtual uh, currency exchanges. Uh, the court has also noted uh, that uh, the interministerial group that was formed uh, uh, to discuss a, a bill on uh, uh, to regulate uh, cryptocurrency and virtual uh, virtual uh, virtual currency exchanges had also uh, di discussed and noted uh, that a complete ban uh, uh, would be uh, counterproductive and would not be necessary. Uh, then the court also went into looking uh, at, at regulations across the world. They noted that uh, the European Union uh, also uh, has uh, taken the path of not a complete uh, ban on financial institutions but on uh, regulation of these aspects. So the court's judgment today was basically uh, uh, the court said that uh, they are not going into the question of whether the RBI uh, has the power to take preemptive actions uh, uh, because uh, the RBI said that even if that, that there were no specific examples, they do have uh, powers to take preemptive actions uh, uh, to uh, uh, pass such circulars. The court has noted uh, that despite this power, uh, that the fact that uh, this is a question also of uh, the fundamental right to carry business, uh, the proportionality test has to be met and which uh, this particular uh, uh, notification or the circular from the RBI has failed to do. Now, as far as regulation is concerned, remember there is also a separate petition which is pending, which was seeking already the, uh, that the government should come out. Uh, with the regulations for cryptocurrency exchanges, that petition is still pending because the court had said that they will first deal uh, with with the RBI circular and the petition and the challenge uh, to that particular issue. So once this is settled, now we will have to see what happens uh, in that particular uh, petition, which is calling for a regulation of uh, cryptocurrency and and the trading around it. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Arpan, for uh, uh, for wrapping up uh, the entire uh, day's events for us. Uh, and thank you so much for watching. Uh, please do log into Bloomberg Quint uh, uh, and and read more about the judgment. Of course, Arpan has, uh, uh, Adwait has written a beautiful copy on it. Uh, and uh, do keep logging into Bloomberg. Thank you so much.